Much of 2019 has been defined by the U.S.-China trade dispute. But the recent tension with China doesn't just highlight differences over trade and tariffs. It also highlights differences over political systems and our different views of freedom, both economic and personal freedom. And not surprisingly, there's an ETF for that. You knew I was getting to this, right? The Alpha Architect Freedom 100 Emerging Market ETF. The symbol is FRDM. This freedom-weighted ETF assigns higher weights to what it considers to be freer countries and lower weights to less free countries and markets, including the worst offenders. Let's bring in Perth Toll. She's the founder of Life and Liberty Indexes and the sponsor and the indexer of FRDM. We have been debating this uh, a lot this year, so thank you very much for being here. What, what's the idea behind this? First off, explain how you decide what country gets a bigger weighting. For example, Taiwan uh, has the, the heaviest weighting here by country. That's an yeah. interesting choice. How do you make these decisions? What yeah. kind of so factors the first, go here? Yeah, so the inputs that go into this have to be objective, they have to be transparent, and they have to be robust. So we use um, the data think tanks from the um, Fraser Institute, the Cato Institute, and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom in Germany. And they have a quantified set of human freedom variables, of so 79 different freedom variables, ranging from the rights to life, rights to to liberty and the rights to property. So uh, it's yeah. a little hard because we put the flags up here, but not, not everything else. Put, put that back there. I just want to show it. Number one is Taiwan at 25 percent. Number two is South Korea at 19 percent. Three is Poland at 14. Four is Chile at 13. And South Africa is eight. This is a very interesting choice. What basket? Did you look at 160 countries? Did you have 50 countries in this? Is we started with a universe of 26 emerging markets countries. Uh -huh. So we started with the emerging markets in this because in the emerging markets, there's much more discrepancy levels between uh, freedom between countries. So you have countries like China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, right. and then you have countries like Poland, Chile, Taiwan, and South Korea. So right. huge. So this is why level. France is not on this, for example. Right. So we didn't do this in developed markets because the developed markets tend to be more homogenous as far as freedom levels. Yeah. Now we have had Mario uh, Marco Rubio on uh, this year, the Senator Rubio, yes. uh, on. Uh, from Florida, who's had a, a lot of criticism of uh, some index construction, particularly MSCI, arguing that he doesn't want uh, government workers in, investing in indexes that are heavily weighted, for example, towards China, that we should reflect our ideals. What do you, how do you feel about that? What do you say to Senator Rubio and, and, and his thoughts on this? Yeah, I can certainly understand where his concerns are coming from, and we share those concerns. Um, we, we don't, however, advocate for government interfering in private markets. But the good news is we, we already have a free market solution for this in what we do in freedom weighting. So yeah. the problem is not with MSCI and, or with the, um, the, the government uh, fund. Yeah. The problem is with the, the way that we weight countries. And in emerging markets, uh, market capitalization weighting just naturally ends up with a lot of weight in China and some of these yeah. other less free countries. And it's very interesting, and I completely agree with you. I don't think the government should be involved in telling what indexes should be in what. And MSCI itself has come out very plainly and right. said, if they make some regulation that US, invest, U.S. government investors cannot invest in something that has China in it, we will just create an index for them that will X China out. They don't seem to be that concerned about it overall. Right. Now, let me just ask you about performance. I don't want, I know we're talking about freedom here, but is there any evidence that countries that are freer than others do better in, in stocks than those that are not? Yeah, so we're looking at very long term when we look at performance. And if you look at history, freer markets tend to be more dynamic and less free markets tend to be more stagnant. So you see that everywhere in history. Um, we do expect that freer markets do perform more sustainably. They recover faster from drawdowns, and they use their human and economic capital or their capital and labor more efficiently. So we do absolutely expect outperformance in the long run, but that cannot be measured in days. It has to be measured in decades. So we've seen Saudi Aramco come to market and is likely to get added to the yeah. MSCI index-based products. Saudi Arabia is not one of the countries that is part of the, the Freedom Index. Is that yeah, right? That's correct. Well, what's the rationale behind that? So Saudi Arabia actually has, they're, they're not too bad on their economic freedom side, but their human freedom side, a lot of it because of their women's freedom issues, um, they have a lot of improvements to make. So they, they, we have a lot of hope that they will make those improvements. They are doing some of that now. Um, as far as women driving and going to sports games and things like that. So we hope they will be in the index one day, but right now it's their human freedom side of their metrics that's causing them to be excluded from the index. Yeah. You know, th this is a fascinating question. This is one of these big, big questions um, of the 21st and 20th century. We used to 
25 years ago, all of us believed that the economic system called capitalism must go hand in hand with the political system called democracy, that the two are just, you know, they just go together naturally. And yet we've seen challenges to this model. China is perhaps the most obvious one, but even more subtle challenges like Singapore, uh, which is a slightly different democratic system. But in, in China, China arguably has been quite successful as a quasi-capitalist system, and yet obviously is not as a, a, a politically as a democracy. Um, can you have, I know this is a broad question, but what do you say to those of us who are rather, you know, amazed still that you can have uh, rather authoritarian governments and still have some uh, capitalism or at least quasi-capitalism that gives the appearance of normal capitalism? What, yeah, how do you so, argue that? So economic freedom, or I think what traditionally has been called capitalism, um, is a prerequisite, but not a, uh, it's a necessary condition, but it's not a, um, it doesn't always lead to human freedom. So we do expect that economic freedom leads to human freedoms at some point, but as you say, that's not always been the case. Now, Singapore specifically, my, this is, comes up often, and it, yeah, it's a very free economically, but politically not so much. Uh, my friend Melissa uh, Chin, who is from there, calls it Disneyland with a death penalty. So it just matters, you know, what, <laughs> what, what your values are. If you want to be in a country where you can have um, opportunity, that's important, and that's economic freedom, and we measure that, that's half our index. The other half is human and political freedoms, and, and that matters as well. Because, yeah, in China, you have some opportunity, which is more yep. than you have in a lot of other countries, and I think that's great. That is great progress they've made on the economic freedom side. But you can't say anything bad about the government, you can't dissent at all, you can't say, oh, we're locking up Uyghurs, no. you know, things like that. So. You can't talk, you know, uh, you can't have freedom of expression. So it just matters, you know, what kind of world you want to live in. Before we let you go, I just want to put up some of the stocks that, that are in here. Taiwan Semi, which makes sense. Samsung, biggest company in Korea. Naspers, uh, largest company in, in, in South Africa. Santander Bank, also a big bank. Hanhai Precision. Now, there's one that might, that's Foxconn at the far end. That's 2%. Uh, they're headquartered in Taipei, and yet we always associate them with mainland China because they're Apple's iPhone supplier. Essentially, right. they're the largest contract electronic maker uh, in the world. Yeah, so we don't penalize the companies in freer markets for doing business or investing in or having um, production in less free markets. So we are you know, highly invested in Taiwan, South Korea, and Chile. Those are all huge traders with China, and they all have you know, investments or um, factories that function there. So we don't penalize them for that. They ultimately answer to the rules, the laws of yeah. Taiwan or yeah. Chile or Poland. Finally, we got to go, but it's still relatively small assets under management, 15, 20 million dollars along those lines. What do you do to let people know that you're out there? So we're just trying to, to get the word out there and let people know that we exist, that there is a, another solution besides a market capitalization waiting in emerging markets, and that's freedom waiting. So. It's extremely new, and we hope that uh, the market will... It, it's very new, and it's a very important part of the way need, people need to look at the world. It's and not just about making money. There is ideologies, and we, we all do stand for something. We're not just here to it is a know, way money to stand, grubbing, stand up you know, for freedom. nasty capitalists. Yeah, and, well, you might be. I'm suspicious of you over there. What, what, we're, we're last e point. We're seeing ESG investing become more popular with U.S. investors. This is ESG with the focus on the G in emerging yeah, markets. That's so a very good way to look at it. Our way of doing that today. Country level ESG. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, guys.